Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is your brother, Hawa Yala. I want to give all glory and praises to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shai, grace and mercy be abound to the hopeful elect scattered throughout the four corners of the earth that are waiting on the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. Going into a lesson concerning uh, the subject of Cornelius, um, uh, me and the brothers a few weeks ago had a discussion uh, concerning uh, Cornelius and um, you know the understanding concerning that topic. Um, in the midst of uh, the discussion, um, it was revealed that the brother Irvin from Mississippi had seen an article uh, concerning a church, uh, La Vista Church of Christ, actually going into the idea uh, that Cornelius was an Israelite foreigner. Right now, the title of that particular article, which I will link in the description box, is Could Cornelius Have Been an Israelite of Foreign Birth? Okay, so... We know that there's a lot of controversy concerning Cornelius, and it's actually one of the um, the flashpoints in the whole argument concerning can other nations be saved? And what I mean by other nations, meaning other groups of people outside of the seed of Israel. Okay, and we know that um, from going through the scriptures um, from the beginning concerning the covenant that the Most High made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises that was given unto the patriarchs concerning their seeds. Uh, that the Most High is only dealing with the nation of Israel, okay? And it's very apparent not only in, you know, time past with the law and the prophets, um, but also even when you go into the Gospels and throughout the book of Acts and in the epistles, um, all the way down to, of course, the book of Revelation, where it shows at the end that those that will be considered worthy all right, to enter into the holy city would be Israelites. Now, as we go on um, in this and uh, for some reason, I don't know why the question is not showing up here, but the question actually is, could Cornelius have been an Israelite uh, foreigner of, or Israelite of foreign birth? Now, we're going to go ahead and go into the answer. It says, uh, this man is used by many as an example of so-called Gentile non-Israelite being saved. The place of birth or citizenship tells us nothing about race. And that's very true because... Your citizenship or your place of birth has nothing to do with your biblical nationality. All right. I mean, let's just look at the history of our people. Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees. Okay. He is of Chaldean descent through the line of Arphaxad. And Ur is all the way situated um, in modern day Iraq, right near the mouth of the rivers. Okay. And then he was taken out of that land um, by the Most High and ventured on a journey towards the land of Canaan in which. He was given the promise about the inheritance that his seed after him would, would receive, okay, which would be now known as the land of Israel. And we go into the covenant with Isaac and then Jacob, and uh, we know that Jacob and his, uh, you know, was moved around as well. We know eventually um, he ended up in Egypt where he died with, um, you know, in his old age um, after during the time of Joseph uh, as well. Now, when you look at even the patriarchs, the patriarchs of Israel, the meaning the sons of Jacob, they were born in Padan and Aram, Syria. Okay? So, if they were born in Syria, what then makes them Israelites, right? Okay? So, they were born in a whole other land um, that wasn't even considered, even in future times, to be the land of Israel. All right? So, we know that being born in a particular place does not change your true biblical race or nationality. Uh, neither is having a citizenship as uh, a Roman, okay? Um, so if you're a Roman, if you're a Roman citizen, that doesn't mean that you are an ethnic native Roman, okay? Which would have been the, the, the Edomites that ruled the Rome. It just means that you're a Roman citizen. And just like here in America today, we have many races in this land and many of them um, are also citizens of Rome, but that doesn't make them the ethnic Edomite Romans. All right, so well, in fact, we'll go into that statement just so you can see concerning Cornelius now it tells you right here in verse 1 there was a centurion in Caesarea called Cornelius a centurion of the band called the Italian band okay so as you see here okay the Italian band 
And this is where a lot of people, the first verse of Acts chapter 10 just throws everything off for a lot of people. All right. So, so Italicos, okay, that's how you would say um, Italian in the Greek. It says belonging to Italia, okay, which is what they would actually call it modern. If you go to Italy, that's what they called Italy. They call it Italia. We call it Italy, okay? And um, basically, it's just someone who is from Italy, okay? So basically, he was foreign born. He was from Italy. And he was a centurion. That doesn't mean that he was um, of another uh, biblical nationality. Now we'll, we'll go into the breakdown and understanding concerning, you know, what it meant by another nation. Okay, because there's a historical reference behind that that um, has been removed in the modern day uh, churches with the removal of certain books. All right. So we'll go on. It says, but this man's race can be determined by scripture. Even if he is not described as a Jew or Judean, in the AV of Acts 10 and 28, Cornelius is described as being of another nation. But the Greek text uses the word alophulos, which is compound of alos, uh, another of the same kind. Okay. And it says, and phulos, a kindred tribe phulos. Okay. And it's very interesting that that word was used. Okay. And in fact, let's go ahead and see how often that word is actually used because we can actually look into the outline of the usage. Because generally, if you go into the scriptures, what will happen is if, the, if he was of another biblical nationality, it would have been said outright that he was of another biblical nationality. Okay, just like they refer, refer to the Idumeans and other nations outright in the Bible and they let you know what they were. This one, they, it was not known what he was, right? Because it goes without saying, just based off the understanding of the word alophulos, okay? Or al alophilos. Now, let's see here. So, simply right here means foreign, okay? Now, they use it as of another nation, but foreign, foreign, especially Gentile of another nation. And we'll, we'll go into why the word Gentile uh, was used as well in terms of the biblical uh, translation. So it says, when used in Hellenic Greek in opposed to a Jew, it signifies a Gentile, one of another nation. Okay. And then uh, when you look at the usage, it was only used one time. Okay. So we go into... Acts 10 and 28. This is what we notice. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you what Cornelius was doing, okay, and why he was, um, why he was uh, chosen, okay? Now, we go into verse 2. It says that he was a devout man and one that feareth Yahweh. So, he feared the Most High, but there was something different about him that was that was different than all the other believers prior when you read in the book of Acts. And when you go through the book of uh, the gospel accounts and the people that believed on Yahweh Shai, when you go through the book of Acts with the other men um, that believed in Yahweh Shai leading up into Cornelius, they were all had one thing in common, okay, that was very telling about them, and this is where the difference comes in, is where Cornelius steps in, alright, so it says, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God all way, he saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the, of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked at him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms have come up to the, for a memorial before God. Okay? So his prayers and his alms, he consistently prayed to the Most High. So he had to know who he was. And he gave alms to the people. And all his house also feared the Most High as well. Okay? Now, when you go back 2,000 years ago, because we have to jump into a time machine and understand that 2,000 years ago, the scriptures was not a book that other nations read. Okay? They were not going around really reading and quoting the scriptures. Okay? It generally was not something that they would do. So in order for someone to have access to that or to know about it and to fear the God of Israel, they would have to have access to that and have a, a level of understanding. 
but there'll be a reason why a man like Cornelius would have been treated differently, um, you know, uh, concerning like his background. And we'll get into that and you'll see the reason why, because it's going to be brought up as we read through the book of Acts. Now, let's go ahead and go back to the article. It says here, Cornelius was a devout man, we were told, and he feared God. Therefore, he was one who could believe. According to Vine, devout means careful as to the presence and claims of God. So Cornelius knew the Old Testament claims of God upon Israel. Okay? And that's just what I said. Because in order for him to be devout and pray to the God of Israel, he would have to know about his Old Testament claims. He'd have to have those access to those scriptures and be reading them. Okay? And then he showed, he showed by his works, okay, his alms, and the way he treated the people, that he cared for the people of Israel, okay? Uh, so it says, we do not find devout being used of people other than Israelites. Exactly. Because if you're not an Israelite, your 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 devotion, right? It's called devotion, because that's where the word devotion comes from. Being devout, your devotion would be to another god. And has the nation changed their gods, which are no gods? The other nations are going to worship other gods. Okay, even counterfeit versions of the Most High, as they do today. Okay, so they're not going to be devout to the God of Israel according to the Scriptures. All right, just like he says that only people being called devout throughout the Scriptures. All right, are Israelites. This is also he feared God, Acts 10 and 2, and he prayed to the God, and, to God, and was heard by God. God here is Hohel, the Theos, okay, the true, one true God, all right? So it says a term used to denote the one true God. So Cornelius was not a Roman polytheist. He was an Israelite, okay? Because the Romans, they worshiped all these different gods. Remember, the, predominant, the dominant culture in the ancient world at this particular time was Roman polytheism, okay? Meaning all the various gods that the Greco Romans worshiped. Now we know that our people fell and began to be like unto the heathen and worship their gods, okay? And we know that that's part of the, um, the conversation that's had throughout the book of Acts and uh, throughout the epistles uh, that were written by the apostles as well. So, Let's go on. It says the evidence that Cornelius was not an Israelite is given by the people of Israel. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contending with him, saying, Ye went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. It says by declaring that Cornelius and his household were uncircumcised, the Jewish Christians were stating that Cornelius was not under the covenant of Moses. Okay, so that's really much when you what happened. In fact, let me go into what happened prior to this incident in Acts 11. This is Acts chapter 10 and verse 37. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Yahweh of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and who who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with them and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on the tree him God raised on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but unto witnesses chosen before of Yahweh even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead to him give all the prophets witness that through the name his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive permission of sins while Peter yet spake these words the Holy Ghost fell on all them which had heard the word and it says, And they of the circumcision which relieved were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, you see here that the, those that were circumcised, okay, that had already believed, they were shocked, okay, that the Holy Ghost fell upon those that were not circumcised. 
And that's really what a Gentile is when you go to the New Testament. It's one that is uncircumcised. And they knew this back in the day, which groups of people among their people were not. Because if they were circumcised, they would have been um, growing up in the customs. They would have been coming back for the high holy days. There would have been um, a record of their circumcision. And I, I talk about this, the whole situation with Timothy and his father. About how the men in those regions, they knew his background. They knew who his dad was. They knew his dad was not circumcised. And they knew that he didn't bring his, his son Timothy to be circumcised. And they knew this concerning Timothy. And they knew this right here concerning um, you know, Cornelius. Okay. So that's why they were shocked by that. Now we're going to go to acts 11 and we're just going to deal with that part. So it says Peter reports at Jerusalem. So Caesar is, is basically North of Jerusalem. So he goes down and, and makes this report in acts 11 and the apostles and brethren were that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with them. So those that were of the circumcision contended with them. So remember, Jew equals circumcision, Gentile equals uncircumcision. Okay, and we'll go into the history behind that. Saying, thou wentest to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. Now remember, in those uh, back in the, those times, if you were known to be an uncircumcised Israelite, they didn't even keep company with you. Okay, this was something that they were doing going back, you know, um, you know, hundreds of years prior to this situ situation. And we'll go into that a little bit so you can understand the history behind it. And so, but Peter, so Peter broke it down. I'm not going to um, read all this, but you can read that whole um, Acts 11 to go into his explanation to the brethren that were in Judea. Okay, now let's go ahead and go back to the article. So when you go back to the article, okay, so we're going to go right here. By declaring that Cornelius and his household were uncircumcised, the Jewish Christians were stating that Cornelius was not under the covenant of Moses, right? Because one of the things is being a male, you had to be circumcised in your flesh in order to show that you are actually a holder of the covenant of Moses. And this is the reason why. When men were born, when young uh, male children were born, they would actually take them to the synagogue and they would get circumcised. And you, and you better believe that back in those days, they actually had records of this. Okay? They had records. They definitely had records. And they knew these people's families. Okay? They knew which line stopped circumcising. They knew which group of men or in their families stopped circumcising for whatever reason. Many of them because they began to be Hellenized and start worshiping other gods. And they wanted to be like unto their oppressors, all right? So, therefore, remember that you, and he's quoting Ephesians 11, uh, 2, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called them circumcision, but what it would, <clears throat> by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So being circumcised in the flesh was equivalent to being a Gentile. That's that's a plain and simple. So, so this particular church, they actually have this understanding very much right. Okay. And um, actually, I'll go over here and just go ahead and quote this Ephesians. Because that was uh, in the New King James version that I just quoted. This is the actual original King James Version. So let's go to Ephesians 2 and 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Okay? Because the circumcision were the Jews. The uncircumcision were the Gentiles. Those people that were uncircumcised that were being called Gentiles were simply uncircumcised Israelites. And they were referred to as another nation. They were considered separate from those that were holding the covenant of Moses. Okay? And that were keeping the, the laws according to the scriptures. And remember, you know, a lot of the people of Israel were scattered throughout, you know, the, those parts of the world and began to follow sometimes the customs of those places. Hence the reason why when you go to Acts chapter 2, which is prior to Acts 10, you will see 
that the, there was devout Jews from every nation under heaven. And, but these men were circumcised and they were coming back with their sons and they were keeping these various high holy days and back in the land. And that's the whole uh, thing of the scene in Acts 2 with Pentecost. That's the reason why they were not called Gentiles. They were not called the uncircumcision. Okay, but Cornelius, in his uh, situation, he was considered a Gentile or uncircumcised. Okay? Now, um, we're going to go ahead and go into the history about how this came about. So this man right here that you're seeing is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now, you're not going to find him in your regular Bible. You have to have an, um, a 1611 King James Bible in order to get the information. And we'll, we'll go into one of the um, some of the verses concerning him. Now, it tells you here that he reigned from... 175 BC until his death, death in 164 BC. Okay, so this is about roughly 200 years or a little over 200 years before the whole Cornelius um, believing. Okay, so there's a history among the Israelites about um, the, this particular contention of circumcision versus uncircumcision. So it says, uh, notable events during Antiochus' reign include his near conquest of Ptolemy uh, in Egypt his persecution of the Jews of Judea and Samaria and the rebellion of the Jewish Maccabees. Okay. And that's what he's mainly known for, you know, um, even, even among secular, uh, historians, that's literally what they talk about concerning him. All right. Now we'll go down to the persecution of the Jews. It says here, the solutions like the Ptolemies before them held a, uh, as suzerainty over Judea, they respected Jewish culture and protected Jewish institutions. This policy was drastically reversed by Antiochus IV, seemingly after what was either a dispute over leadership of the temple in Jerusalem and the office of high priest, or possibly a revolt whose nature was lost to time after being crushed. Antiochus issued decrees forbidding many traditional practices, okay, that includes circumcision, and began a campaign of persecution against devout Jews. The triggered, this triggered a revolt against his rule, the Maccabean Revolt. Scholars of the Second Temple of Judaism therefore sometimes refer to Antiochus' reign as the Antiochian crisis for the Jews. These decrees were a departure from typical solution practice which did not attempt to suppress local religious religions in their empire. Okay. Because if you go into the rise of the um, the Greek Empire, when the Greek Empire came about during the time of um, Alexander the Great, when those regions were being conquered, Alexander and the men under him uh, that eventually took over after him uh, decided not to do any changes uh, within our land as far as what we did. So we kept our high priests, we were able to still keep our laws, our customs, and uh, without being um, persecuted, okay? It wasn't until Antiochus came into the picture, and mind you, um, just to get an idea, the reign of Alexander the Great started around 332 BC. So we're talking about, you know, roughly like 160 years of just being unbothered during the time of the uh, Greek empire, up until the time of Antiochus IV. Um, so you have to know that timeline of what was going on so up until that time for almost 160 years we're talking about almost two centuries we were able to still do what we were doing prior okay um and then things changed under antiochus and then that's when he started doing these crazy decrees now um and and it led to a massive amount of a death and mind you there was a civil war um, which if y'all read the book of Maccabees, you'll know that the Maccabees went up and slew many of the Jews that had been rocking with the, uh, with the solution. Okay. That was rocking with the enemy. So we, even within our own, uh, selves during that time, there was a civil war. So there was great contention between those that were quote unquote circumcision versus the uncircumcision. There was great contention and this contention uh, continued on all the way up into the time of Cornelius. Okay, so we have to under have the understanding of that history. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and read. This is a this is the book of Maccabees, the first book of Maccabees in chapter one. This is verse 41. So this is the same King uh, Antiochus, uh, the fourth Epiphanes. Now it says, moreover, King Antiochus wrote to the whole his whole kingdom 
that all should be one people. Does that sound familiar? Here in Babylon, you're right, one world, one government, one world order, United Nations, all one people. And everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. So the heathens in these different regions, the other non-Israelites, they consented. Okay, and then we're going to see what happened with our people. Yay. Many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. Okay, now this process is known as Hellenization. I did a lesson um, years back on the on Hellenization. It's in, I believe there is a Gentiles or a playlist uh, that is also available on our page. If you check our playlist, you'll see where we do a series on that. And this particular lesson will be added to that particular uh, playlist to have the understanding of this whole topic concerning, you know, who were the Gentiles in the Bible, in the New Testament, who was Paul and the different apostles reaching out to during that time. So again, verse 43, yea, many also the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah that they should follow the strange laws of the land and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days and pollute the sanctuary and holy people set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine flesh and unclean beasts that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation okay so you see here that they should leave their children uncircumcised okay so let me go down into this okay so we're gonna go verse 60 at which time according to the commandment they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised so they put to death women that had circumcised their sons and they hanged the infants about their necks and rifled their houses and slew them that had circumcised them Howbeit many in Israel were fully resolved and confirmed in themselves not to eat any unclean thing wherefore the rather to die that they might not be defiled with meats and that they might not profane the holy covenant so they died and there was very great wrath upon Israel okay now there were many like we read earlier of the Israelites that consented to this decree of Antiochus and they left the law and they left from uh, from circumcising their children and they began to basically be in heavy idolatry and that went about for hundreds of years prior to the time of Cornelius so what happened is over time you begin to have descendants of Israel living in other lands that grew up uncircumcised but had fear of the Most High okay and we got many people throughout the whole Israelite uh, community that were not circumcised but that later on believed in the scriptures even today because I know 100% of, of, of Israelites or people that are self proclaimed Israelites are not circumcised it's, it's not 100% okay Okay, and that's the same situation with Cornelius. Many of these brothers with this uh, um, that are reading about Cornelius, they mirror many of his, um, they mirror his life in their own flesh, their own selves being uncircumcised, okay, not growing up in the proper customs, get introduced to the scriptures, fear the Most High, and begin to do works worthy in the eyes of the Most High. And then there, you know, the Most High brings them into this thing and they believe, right? And so it's no different than Cornelius uh, concerning the whole issue of the circumcision versus the uncircumcision or what we also know in the scriptures as a Jew versus Gentile. All right. So hopefully this is edifying to you, brothers and sisters. And again, I want to give all glory and praises to Yahweh Ba'asham, Yahweh Shai. Grace and mercy be abound to the hopeful elect scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. Shalom.